Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Verity by Verse. I'm Keith, your host. Today, I want to share some important words we all need to consider for conscience sake as we position ourselves in light of this upcoming presidential election. As always, if this video blesses you, please like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell to be notified of future shows. Now let's get started. Beloved in Christ, we have the light of life. Do you hear me? We who are in Christ have the light of life, and nobody else on the planet does. Sure, others get to benefit from its glow, but we are not mere beneficiaries. We are light bearers. And this is important to remember as we are constantly faced with the ever-shifting, ever-worsening cultural landscape and its efforts to either influence us or to silence us. Sadly, society doesn't realize how desperately it needs the body of Christ. But we must never be ashamed of our roles as children of the light and of the day, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. So what is the light? Ultimately, the light is Yahweh, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. The light is the Holy Spirit who gives us the new birth, who enlightens our understanding of God, and who permanently indwells us as born-again believers in Christ. You see, 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And Jesus came forth from the Father, John 16, 27, 28, and 13, 3. He is God of very God, co-equal with the Father and the Spirit in shared essence, Colossians 2, 9. We also know that the God who, from the beginning of creation, said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light three whole days before he even made the sun, moon, and stars, is the same God of whom Revelation 22-5 says, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Just as God who is light illumined all creation before he made a single star, God, who is the light, will forever light all who will spend eternity with him without the need of the sun, moon, and stars. And unlike from the first day of creation until the end of this fallen sinful world, our illumination will be forever without even a hint of darkness because we will be fully glorified and that without trace or possibility of sin ever again. This is why, for example, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. No man has ever appeared in this life in his born-again, glorified body. The closest we can get to understanding what that might look like is what Peter, James, and John got to witness on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus showed them a glimpse of his glory. Again, that was just a glimpse. Christ's full glory is too much for a fallen sinful creature to behold. And that is why the Jews firmly believed that no one could see God and live. After all, the Lord literally told Moses this truth when he begged God to let him see his glory. Exodus thirty-three eighteen to 23 says, Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about, while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And we know what happened to Moses' face after spending all those days up on Mount Sinai with God. The next chapter, verses 29 to 35, tells us that his face shined so brightly that the people were afraid to look at him. So he wore a veil over his face until the glory finally faded. I believe even then, the Lord was showing us a glimpse of our glorified bodies. You see, beloved, God is light. And of course, God is not only light, but without God, there is no light at all. He created physical light, and for all who will spend eternity apart from him, he will rescind all light in order to leave them in outer and utter darkness in the eternal torment of fire that burns but does not blaze. Again, complete darkness. Jesus repeatedly spoke of this darkness, which will produce endless weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, 22, 13, 25, 30. So what is my point with this? Well, it goes back to what Jesus said sometime during the seven-day-long Feast of Tabernacles. It is found in John 8, 12, which says, 
Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Perhaps Jesus was referencing the temple court of women at the Feast of Tabernacles, which was kept brightly lit with large candelabras each of the seven nights of the festival. It was said to be so bright that the light could be seen from everywhere in the city, but that light only lasted for seven days. Jesus contrasted that temporal light with the eternal light that he ever was, is, always will be, and which he gives to all who truly believe in him. Yet the light of life does not only involve the physical darkness diffusing glory of God, but it also involves the light of wisdom and understanding. For example, the Apostle Paul prayed for the saints in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Without the light of life that is deposited within us by the Holy Spirit, our hearts and minds remain darkened to the wisdom and revelation knowledge of God. In fact, one of the primary ministries of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate our minds to understand Scripture and all the spiritual blessings we have been blessed with in the heavenlies, Ephesians chapter 1. So the light is ultimately an attribute of Yahweh, and the world was given a glimpse of it in the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the world continues to be illumined and or convicted by it in the Holy Spirit who indwells every born-again believer in Christ. And no, we do not walk around glowing like Moses' face once did. We get to be the light of the world in how we live as we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit, who also is here to continually testify of Jesus in and through us. Again, we are light bearers. And Jesus said of himself in John 9, 5, that while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But Jesus has returned to his eternal glory. So while we are here with his spirit living in us, we are, as Jesus also said in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, which was, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. You see, we are indeed light bearers. Our jobs as Christians is to bear witness with our lives and our lips of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And that light brings with it countless blessings because it starts with the beginning of wisdom, which is the fear of the Lord. And it goes on to benefit society in countless ways. Wherever our light shines, a society is either blessed by it if it seeks to align itself with God's good, acceptable, and perfect will, or a society is cursed by it if it opposes or rejects God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. It's not about us thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought, saints. It's about thinking most highly of Christ, who is our life. And that leads me to my ultimate point in light of this crazy, contentious, and even corrupt U.S. presidential election cycle. Though the Statue of Liberty's torch is said to burn for enlightenment and freedom, and the book she holds is said to stand for the rule of law, America and its leadership continuously fall miserably short of those ideals. But we, the blood-washed born-again believers in Christ, need to remember that we, not Lady Liberty, we, not Uncle Sam, we and the only we, have the light of life, because we and only we, as born-again believers, have the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the degree that a political party's or politician's policies accept or reject the light of righteousness and truth, as prescribed by God in Scripture, is the degree to which we are to accept or reject them and their platforms. Remember, the only reason there is anything good, moral, or upright about anyone or anything in this fallen world is because of the Father of Lights, James 1.17. All else is a deception of the Father of Lies, John 8.44. But let's look at James 1.17 to make sure that we don't get God's goodness twisted. It says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of Lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. We praise God daily for his goodness, long-suffering, mercy, and grace. And we also realize that one day he will withdraw his goodness, which will precipitate the greatest tribulation the world has ever seen or will ever see. Mark 13, 19. The book of Revelation makes that crystal clear. But notice that it also says that with God there is no variation or shifting shadow. This is an illustrative reference to the moon and the stars God created. They, through their courses, appear in variations and experience and cause shifting shadows. 
But God is not like that. And God expects us to be imitators of God as dear children, Ephesians 5.1. We are to consistently practice righteousness because he has made us righteous in his sight. That is why in the next verse, James 1.18, it says that it was of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. As the first fruits of his creatures, we are to live in the realization that the Father of lights is our eternal Father, and we, as Ephesians 5.8 says, are to walk as children of light. So in reality, it is not that Christians are trying to align themselves with the Republican Party, and we definitely should not be supporting the Democrat Party at this point. But it is that anyone who wants to reap the benefits of a good, moral, truth-loving, decent, non-violent, non-murderous, law-abiding, and prosperous society wants what ultimately only God can give, whether they even know God or not. It's just the way it is. Yahweh still sends his reign on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5.45. He's just that long-suffering. But the unjust will not escape judgment. The point is that the earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and they that dwell therein, Psalms 24.1. In other words, this is still our Father's world, even though he permits Satan to be its false god for now, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We know that goodness and morality ultimately only comes from the Father of lights. And so we are not trying to align ourselves with the people of the world. They, if they cherish those benefits we offer, are trying to align with us. And because we are who they need infinitely more than we need them, we must make it clear to all parties and politicians involved that when and if you veer away from God or attack his word, his created order, or his earthly institutions, we will stand against you as much as biblically expedient. And I would challenge any Christian who thinks he or she has good grounds for supporting the Democrat Party at this point to prove to me with rightly divided biblical truth how the DNC is not actively platforming policies and legislations that directly attacks God's created order of male and female, the value and dignity of innocent human life from conception, and his earthly established institutions of marriage and family, human government, and the church. And this is also a warning to President Trump and to VP candidate Vance and the rest of the Republican Party. We see you beginning to soft pedal on abortion. You had better reconsider or you may find yourself losing in November by allowing the lies of the left to creep in and pull you away from God's truth concerning the murderous practice of infanticide. True Christians know that words matter and empty words deceive. So we understand and adhere to scripture. We know, for example, that Ephesians 5, 6 to 10 tells us, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to use Christianity to gain points if you will, but I assure you that God will not be mocked. Such exploitation will sooner or later become your downfall. Deciding to remove abortion ban policies from the party platform might be a form of passive concession to you, but to sin and Satan, the needle is always moving in one direction or the other. And so if you are not proactively pushing against evil, you are actively seeding the fertile soil of further compromise to the tears and snares of the enemy. And God will indeed hold you accountable for that. Reconsider your weaker stance on abortion, or don't be surprised if you lose in November. Virtually nothing else matters if the most innocent human lives among us don't, no matter how we try to spin it. Stand on righteousness and trust God, or take matters into your own frail hands and get what you get, which I can promise you won't be the best outcome. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, and he makes all mankind responsible to fear and to obey him. And with that, let's revisit that God is light passage for a little more of the context. 1 John 1, 5 through 10 says, This is the message we have heard from him and have announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. True Christians agree with God's word about all sin, which is what confess our sins means in verse 9. 
To push for and seek to legislate policies that contradict God's word is no different than saying we have not sinned. Because if we truly agree with God about those policies, we won't build a platform on them. We would want to have nothing to do with such presumptuous sins. So if you are a Christian and you plan to vote this November, the choice should be relatively easy at this point. The Republican Party to date has not yet, and I emphasize yet, attacked or rejected God's created order or his three great institutions with its policies and legislation. The Democrat Party clearly has. But ultimately, remember this, the Republican Party still seems to want the benefits that we bring. They need us. It is not the other way around. So we who are in Christ must speak up and demand that our elected party officials not make any concessions that contradict or violate scripture. Because a minor concession today, which is where it all starts, can easily end up a major recession tomorrow. Therefore, as it stands today, I as a born-again believer in Christ can still vote Republican in good conscience. But there is no guarantee that I will, not when I see a softening on, of all things, the lie of abortion deceptively labeled as reproductive care. Mr. Trump, mind your words, sir. You are on dangerous ground. One cannot reproduce by subtraction. Reproduction is by multiplication. Only a lying leftist liberal deceived by the devil would try to get us to believe such empty words and fair speeches. I hope you will seriously reconsider your use of that false terminology. May we who are in Christ not allow this Isaiah 5, 20 age we are living in to conform us to its culture of lawlessness, sexual perversion, and death. We have the light of life. We are pro-life because we are children of the God of the living. We are those who are of the way, the truth, and the life. Luke 20, 38 and John 14, 6. Yet, not every one of us will be compelled to be directly involved in politics, but as long as human government exists and as long as we who are in Christ have a great commission, God will have many of his people involved in government. And I'm not saying that a Christian must vote. I'm saying that it is expedient that we continue to make God's will known in various ways, including voting or not voting, as long as our consciences are clear on it. And true Christians cannot vote for those whose policies defy God's word, reject God, or aim to subvert his created order of male and female, and the sanctity of human life from conception, or his earthly institutions of marriage between one man and one woman, lawful human government, and the church, the pillar and ground of God's truth, Genesis to Revelation. And I'm aware that I am repeating myself, but these factors cannot be overstated. So one final word about having the light of life. Jesus made it absolutely clear that only those who follow him will have the light of life. The rest will walk in darkness. That means that sin and Satan will maintain power over them in this life. After death, they will be judged and cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever, also known as the second death. Revelation chapter 20. You see, light is sown not for the wicked, but for the righteous. In fact, Psalms 97, 10 to 12 says, You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. My friend, only Christ can make you righteous. That's what it means to follow him. And you can only follow him through true faith in him and his life, death, burial, and resurrection. So I urge you to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and continually call on his name in prayer until he has heard and saved you. If he does save you, you will know it because your heart will be changed and so will your life because he will come and make his abode within you. You will have the light of life. You will begin to hate your sin and begin to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. You will start to walk in the light even as God is in the light. You will have fellowship with him and all of his saints as his son's blood cleanses you from all sin. So I pray you find God's gracious repentance and faith unto salvation today. Because now, not later, today, not tomorrow, is the day of salvation. God saves everyone, without exception, who truly believes on his son. But I've said all I need to say for now. Beloved, think biblically, live righteously, and most importantly, remember that we are light in the Lord. So let us walk, even in political realms, as children of light.